So today we are going to talk about the background history for the medieval period, starting from the Battle of Hastings in 1066 to the beginning of the Renaissance in 1485. Okay, so we already know about the Battle of Hastings. This is when the Anglo-Saxon period really comes to an end and the medieval period begins. So the Battle of Hastings, uh, 1066, this is when Harold the Saxon, at the time the King of England, was defeated by William the Conqueror, the Duke of Normandy. Um, and so this is really the beginning of what we know as a more unified uh, England, a less tribal England, England under one monarch. Okay? And the medieval period is also known as the Middle Ages because it occurs in between the Anglo-Saxon period and the Renaissance. I doubt very much that people in the medieval period would think of themselves as in the middle of two maybe uh, more important time periods or two more well-known time periods, um, but that is kind of uh, the name that we, that we give it. We know it because it comes in between the tribal Anglo-Saxon pagan time and the Renaissance, the time of Shakespeare and uh, all the things that you guys know, I'm sure, have studied before. But that's not to say that the medieval period is unimportant. Many important things took place historically and also in terms of the development of the English language and the development of uh, literature in this time period. Okay, so changes brought about by William the Conqueror uh, there's more business exposure for England, so England becomes a more stable country and also a much more powerful country. This is where certain professions take place, uh, take shape. So soldiers, lawyers, and doctors, these uh, professions become known, and we will see examples of these uh, people who had these professions in Canterbury Tales. Okay, and in addition to English, uh, uh, the people here spoke Norman and French. And again, languages are still mixing and intermingling and influencing each other. So English is still very much evolving. And English, uh, the, the English that they are speaking in this time period is known as Middle English. If you guys remember from Beowulf, Old English, you must have a translation to read it. It's no longer readable uh, as English we know as we know it today. Middle English is closer to the English that we speak, but you still will need a translation. The spellings um, at times are different than the pronunciations, and it, it still can be uh, very tricky. So we will be, of course, reading translated versions of the works of literature. Okay, as far as religion goes, we are now speaking about a Christian Europe. Christianity has taken hold, specifically in England. This played a great role in the lives of medieval people. Now, no longer the pagan worldview that your, your life on earth is really all that there is. Instead, the Christian idea that your life on earth is short but will lead to a much longer, even more important afterlife. And all people want their afterlife to be with God in heaven. So all people want to attain that afterlife. In this time period, Latin is the official language of the church. So most important documents that the church housed and copied were still transcribed in Latin. However, the English language is gaining prominence, and uh, there are some very important works of English created in the medieval period. And uh, again, English is still becoming an, uh, an important language, a language that important documents uh, are copied in, but it takes a while for this to really take shape. Okay, okay I'm sure you guys have studied the feudal system before. Okay, um, you know, essentially, we now have land ownership, which means that we have a more stable version of society, less tribal version. So the king, of course, sits at the top, 
Okay, and just underneath the king are other members of the monarch, okay, as well as the church. Okay, and then you would have land owners, okay, and then underneath those land owners would be people who lived and worked on the, the land known as serfs. So essentially, it's like a big pyramid, and uh, everybody knows their place, so there's some stability here, okay, and, and less uh, fighting over, over land and ownership. Okay, Christendom, the definition for Christendom basically refers to countries in which Christians make up the majority of the population or the worldwide community of Christians. So this means that even though there are countries in Europe with different ways of thinking, different traditions, and different languages, we now have Christianity kind of blanketing um, most of Europe at this point. So, so Christians, it, even if they are in different countries, they at least share this religion and this worldview. Um, and so we call that Christendom. Okay, and as the top uh, definition here states, this is one way to unite men of different nationalities, different languages, and different regional ways of life. All right, as I said, everybody knew their place in the feudal system, so the land ownership uh, creates a more sa stable society. However, there's very little uh, in the way of advancing. So if you're born at the bottom of that pyramid as a, a poor and lowly serf, you were unlikely to ever leave that station of society. One way to advance would be to advance through the church, okay, and, it, and the church has its own hier hierarchy uh, with local priests who are overseen by bishops in certain regions, the cardinals in Rome um, who are underneath the pope, and the pope, of course, in Rome uh, at the top of the, the hierarchy of the church. And in the medieval period, this is kind of the beginning of a tension that exists between the church and the monarchy. So there's a question now as to who really is in charge of the people. Is it the bishops? Uh, is it the pope in Rome? Or is it the monarchy, the king? And there, of course, is tension from the very beginning as to who has more control and more authority more power. And eventually, if you guys know what happens with Henry VIII coming up later in the Renaissance, uh, eventually England breaks free from the Catholic Church in Rome. Uh, but that's not for a while. But the tension already exists kind of from the very beginning in the medieval period. And we will talk about that a little bit with Canterbury Tales. Okay, life during the medieval period is still very difficult. Uh, no modern comforts, travel is still very difficult at this time, but there, of course, uh, are some uh, advancements made during this time period. Uh, there are roads built, uh, exposure for England, as I said, happens in terms of trade. So England gains prominence in terms of um, exposure to the rest of the world. Okay, and uh, architecture buildings improve in this time period. So we have castles and abbeys and monasteries and churches built. And many of the churches and those, those structures that were built in the medieval period still exist in Europe today, and they are quite beautiful. Um, so the difficulty and harshness of life oftentimes was made up for in church splendor, the beauty and the vastness of these, these churches and these structures. And all of that was meant to connect the lowly uh, serf, the lowly poor uh, peasant to what they could perceive as a very beautiful, splendid afterlife. Again, that was, that was much more important than your life on earth. In the medieval period, this is where the traditions of the Catholic Christian mass take place. Um, this is where the evolution of what priests wear during, um, during mass take place. Many of the traditions that still exist in the church today, the formalities of the church 
uh, take shape in the medieval period. And all of that is designed, again, to remind people and connect them what they might perceive as uh, an afterlife with God. Okay, chivalry. You might think of chivalry today in terms of just a well-mannered, sensitive man being sort of polite towards a woman. But in the medieval period, it was part of a code of knights that they were sworn to live by. And it's very much like the Anglo-Saxon code of honor. So courage, justice, mercy, generosity, and faith. So very much like the Anglo-Saxon code of bravery, but now you can see the Christian influence um, also tied in with piety and Christian faith, nobility and hope. Um, so there's an evolution here with the idea of chivalry that connects to medieval romances and tales of knights and ladies in waiting and, and the things that we're going to see specifically with the, the legend of King Arthur in this, this unit. Okay, so chivalry joins with romance and literature. We now have tales that feature magic and enchantments, giants, dragons, wizards, sorceresses. We see uh, examples of the, the themes of medieval romances in, specifically for you guys, the, the tale of King Arthur and his knights. Okay, uh, the Black Death is present during this time period, of course. The plague is basically always present in Europe um, for the time periods that we'll be talking about. It never really goes away. But in 1348, there's a huge outbreak of the Black Death and about a third of England died. So we, the death is kind of always in the background of this literature. Uh, it's always present and um, disease functions symbolically in, in a lot of the literature. And it's something just to keep in mind, um, because of course, this continues all the way through um, in the Renaissance, there's periods of uh, outbreaks that occur um, throughout British history. Uh, but specifically here, we'll be talking about that in Canterbury Tales um, and in the partner's tale. And that's a reference uh, to the fact that disease and death was just a part of life in this time period, always in the background. <laughs> 